we at least want you to try to find that. Uh, in here, uh, on page two, you know, location of discharge. So if we have a discharging system, an aerator, a new NPDES system, you know, find that discharge line. We want to make sure that it's actually clean and flowing. Same way with these things. These things should discharge. Uh, we want to make sure that that pipe is clear. If it's down halfway down a hill and it may be, you know, 20 years later been silted over, this may not have a discharge anymore. So it may be hard to find, but uh, this should actually have a discharge line. And what we want, and I'm going to go into it here a little bit further now, when we do sand filter bed inspections, I want to know, well, first of all, you should be able to, to put the dye in at the house. That gives us a time frame as far as when it goes through the tank and how quickly we see it discharge. We don't want to see it discharge at the road ditch within 15 minutes. So that all depends on where you put the dye in. Did you put it in the house? Did you put it in the outlet of the tank? Because that's going to be a big difference in time. So when you do sand filters, I want to know where you, where you put the dye in and then how long it took to, you know, for that dye to go through the whole entire tank and then discharge to wherever it's discharging to. And then I also, you know, observable effluent. Is it clear? You know, granted it's going to be green or red or whatever you guys normally use. Does it have an odor? Is it clear? You know, and the time it took, you know, did it take 45 minutes? Did it take an hour to, to actually get that discharge line? Okay. Because we see all kinds of, all kinds of filter beds, and we, we don't know, you know, it could have grits, it could have sand, but there could be even pea gravel. We see a lot of pea gravel. That's not getting, it's going to fly through that filter bed. You're going to see it quickly. And if that's the case, then they will end up replacing that system. Any questions for filter beds? I know that's sometimes confusing for people. I was going to add to that. Okay. Uh, filter beds are, are, an, are an enigma. Uh, they're, they're very difficult for you and for us to evaluate properly. You put dye into it, that only gives you one part of the picture. So where, where we currently, and I can't say the state law may change this, but where we currently kind of make our cutoffs at, assuming that everything's working the way it should, is uh, older filter beds will sometimes, well many times, have pea gravel in them. Pea gravel doesn't treat anything except take the chunks out. So then you get a little more recent. You might get into the, oh, 70s up and through the early 90s, and you're going to see uh, some sand in there. Sometimes, many times you see grits or some large sand kind of grits combination. So even when I started, I was seeing the tail end of, and that was 95, I was seeing the tail end of, be, of grits being used. So we've kind of made a cutoff here that, you know, assuming that the effluent quality is clear and has no odor, that we're going to accept grits, barring there's nothing else going on with the system. Uh, more recent, from the mid-90s until 2006, when we, were, we had to stop using them, uh, you're more likely to see an actual good sand media. So those are, that's the best. That's what we should be seeing. That is um, going to provide the best treatment, and it should take the longest amount of time to come out of the system. So we know there's a whole bunch of variables that weigh into all this. Uh, I had an individual who... Uh, was doing a test on the system and he put the dye into the lift pump just prior to the filter bed and it flew out. Well, we allowed, we'd like to allow time for it to make its normal path through septic tanks uh, and then into the lift pump if, if there be one. Yeah, Jim. On, on the, where you place the dye, I, I guess I don't understand if you would put it, I mean, flush it down in the motor, I understand that, and the fact that it has to cycle through a tank. Yeah. But if you, if you have access to the discharge end of a tank, yeah. I would think that that, that would be it's still got to go through the system. I see Deb shaking her head no, but I've had systems where I've run, I've run water for 25, 30 minutes and still haven't got anything, any dye to the bottom. I wish, I wish that was the way it was a lot yes. of times when it's filled with Well, I'm saying when it turns in that tank, yeah. it doesn't get through that tank quick enough that you can have an accurate you got to remember that tank is 24-hour hold time treatment. Supposedly. Yeah. But if you're really looking for the dye for the, for the performance of the filter yeah. bed. But it's a performance of the whole system is what you're looking at. It's, again, we've kind of come to this conclusion because we've seen a lot of them. I'm not disagreeing with you. I know where you're coming from. But you introduce dye into a box on a grits filter bed, <laughs> you're going to be out there in 40, minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gives a false indication to us when Jason receives that, okay, what really is going on here? So a lot of times we have to take a second visit to those properties 
Okay, we, the, the biggest thing I'm looking for right now on a middle-aged filter bed is the effluent quality and odor. That's the biggest thing I'm looking for. Did, well, should there be somewhere on the report that says where the dye was placed? I, I thought about putting that, but I was like, I, I figured if, if you're doing filter beds, just write it down where you would place it. Yeah, just, just write it down. I mean, we've even had times where it was kind of questionable how quickly it came out. We've had people actually dig down to see what was actually... We've done that a lot of times. Actually there. We'll dig down. And I'm not saying that you have to do this, but a lot of times at the end of the day when we go out and we're kind of in the middle of the road on what to decide about a filter bed, we take a shovel out, we dig down past the distribution pipe and down into the media. And if it's, if it's pea gravel, it's done. If it's, if it's grits or smaller and everything else seems to be working properly, we normally pass that, barring any other usual things that go on with it. Because they can channel, and then you get all sorts of when I went back out. That's one thing I want to talk about as far as uh, if it's a discharging system and you see it discharged there, leach lines. I know we have some people do, and I've seen it here lately, where they do the inspection on Monday and they turn the report to me on Tuesday. We usually want to go out at least the second day to make sure it didn't take you know, too long for that dye either get to the creek or get to the culvert, get, get to the ditch, or get to the surface. That's why when you do the inspection one day and give it to me the next, I'm like, okay, did they go out that second day and just turn it into me you know, in the morning? Or, so that's why go out two days. We always do, unless it's a discharging system we know that we've seen the entire system. Uh, these are some old photos we brought from uh, actually an illegal install, <laughs> but uh, we got some old photos. I think the homeowner took these while it was being illegally installed. But these are some fairly old photos of what a uh, what a uh, filter bed should look like. So you can see here, you know, they have all their collect. You don't see the collection line here, but it's below this. And then at that point, you know, the, the tanks in front of this. So at that point, then they, you know, they fill their, their sand, grits, or whatever it was at that point with their distribution box you see it coming from the tank. This is what those supply lines look like. You see anything missing in that illegal system? An inspector. <laughs> that was one thing. Permit. <laughs> Gravel under the pipe, they laid the pipe right on top of the sand. sand. But they did put their gravel in the next slide. Yes, the gravel was in the next slide. I got some of those. So you see the whole bunch of gravel they put in. You see here, but yeah, it's just sitting right on top of the sand here. You can see the gravel as it's going in. And uh, this is your drain here. You can see it looks like they had some type of homemade culvert, whatever, catch basin. But uh, you will see a drain. And it, it, it's, it's deep. Like I said, you can see the gravel here. I mean, you can see how deep that is. Maybe Three, four feet below. That, that, Hopefully, nobody recognizes this installation. Yes, because we studied that backhoe to see who's yeah. sitting on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that die test, and I put the die down the toilet. That one came out in 20 minutes. Yeah, that's a normal pipe. Yeah, that's a normal pipe. It's, it's so variable. Yeah. It is so variable. Usually, on a good, on a well-made sand filter, it'll be the next stage for you to see the die. Yeah. And it, it, like I said. Make sure you do that. You know, if you see the outlet, and you see it flowing. You know, what is that called? Does it smell? Does it you know, cloudy? Is it black? You know, describe all that stuff. That's what these. That's what these lines are for down here at the bottom. You know, write as much as you can. The more you write down, the better I can get a feel for what's going on out, especially out there. If you need another sheet, add another <coughs> blank sheet or another uh, notebook sheet to your inspection. Just say, page. You know, see additional, see addendum, or see additional page. So the more information you give me about filter beds, sand filters, the better. That way, less calls I have to make to you and less that we have to actually send more inspectors out or you guys back out to figure out what the filter material is. So this is a leach bed. Looks pretty much almost like a sand filter, except there's no collection pipe coming out here at the bottom. <coughs> We're going to talk about your connections between ABS, ABS to PVC as far as how they should be, how they shouldn't be, why they shouldn't be used, so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I don't know that anybody in here does that, but uh, we, you really want to keep away from connecting ABS and PVC 
if you take the state of Ohio plumbing code as a reference point, you're not allowed to do that except one time, right, Sean? One time outside the foundation, uh, and, and usually you're going to find it, let's say they came out with ABS and you make your connection with PVC, and there is a particular type of glue. It's not the multi purpose glue, it is a transition glue. It's in the green can, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's the only time that should happen. Now, I was on a job recently, uh, I was, um, I think it was flood, I believe it was flood dose. Anyway, there was connections uh, from the pump tank going up the hill that were PVC and it went to ABS and back and forth again. And uh, we don't want to see that uh, because we don't want these, these connections blowing apart at some point in the future. And that's, that's the risk we take. There, there is some pressure inside these lines and some jostling that takes place. And certainly as ground settles and shifts, we don't want to have connections made with ABS and PVC. You probably won't find that problem until some years down the road where it actually uh, shows itself. So we don't want that to be done. Now, along that same line, I, I, I questioned on this job, and I, had a, I actually had to call the manufacturer on this. I want to talk a bit just about multi-zone valves because they're so commonly <laughs> used. Uh, multi-zone valves are constructed of ABS. I, I just learned that. I mean, they're black, obviously, but they're, they're, they are ABS. The manufacturer states that you can use, and I just, I'm going to contradict myself already, you can use a multi-purpose glue and a PVC to glue into, and I, well, I believe into is threaded, if I'm not mistaken, but coming out of the multi-zone valve, you can use that. But I also asked, well, can you not use ABS and use an ABS cement? And they said, absolutely, that's probably the strongest joint you're going to have out of your multi-zone valve. So what happens here is I tell you pipe connections have to be made like pipe to like pipe. Then we get in a situation like this, and the, the manufacturer's recommendations take over. We have a device that they manufacture. They're supposed to be the ones that tell us how is best to use them. So in that case, you can do it, uh, but no other time do we want to see those connections ABS and PVC <coughs> together. Is there any questions about that? Yeah. Right. You can use a threaded, like a Mel. Yes. Long yes. thread them. If you're doing a threaded fitting, yes, there are certain banded fittings that can be used too, but we don't want to see a direct connection with like a with a coupling from ABS to PVC with a coupling there. That's especially just those non-pressurized couplings because they're such a small joint where it can blow apart so easily. Okay. This is another thing. I I don't know if I mentioned this at the at December of last year's meeting, but uh, talking to some of the people that provide the aerators that we use, a lot of the aerators we use, they do not recommend, and actually they don't want, People, when we are doing property transfer inspections, to slug 180 gallons of water through those units. Um, because you're just going to get an alarm status. Usually, uh, I know some of them, you know, you have surge protection. It's going to surge right up. It's going to give you a high water alarm. So if you are doing, you know, a uh, property transfer inspection of a uh, either a discharge system or an aerator with on-site leaching, run some water through you know, from the toilet so you can actually see water enter the tank. That's one thing. We make sure it's not cracked in between the house and the tank. Sometimes you see it cracked through the wall, shows up in a foot or something. Uh, so make sure you run dye there, you see it enter the tank. You know, run a little bit of water so you see it flow through the, through the different tanks of the system. But then after that, uh, you know, don't slug the whole 180 gallons. Maybe run 20 gallons, 30 gallons through there so you can actually see the water. And then at that point, you guys may need to start carrying hoses with you or use the homeowner's hose if they have one. Hydraulically load from the lift station, uh, distribution box if it's on-site leaching. Um, that way, um, we're not overloading, pushing bacteria out of the system. You know, those those things are designed to hold <coughs> hold that stuff in there. If we're slugging 180 gallons through, it's going to end up pushing bacteria if it's a discharging system out of the system. We don't want to do that. So, and it also is going to set alarm status and could be moving all kinds of solids through filters and whatnot. So, I'm sure. If you're here and you actually supply those units, I'm sure you probably agree. I've talked to a couple of them, and they both agree that, yes, you should not be pushing that much water through those units. So run a little bit through the house, use the hose when you get outside, and put it in the lift station. Uh, or, you know, in the outlet of the tank, something like that. That way we can uh, somewhat, you know, guarantee that we're not doing something to that aeration unit. 